It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out to AMC Kansas City Film Fest, our seminar day. Appreciate everyone showing up. Uh, today's uh, discussion is about finding distribution. And uh, my name is Edward Stenzel. I don't know if you've been in some of the other panels, but uh, I've been involved with the festival since uh, it started uh, 16 years ago. And uh, I lived here in Kansas City for quite a few years, and then I moved out to Los Angeles, and I've been back and forth. Uh, well, I've been pretty much here almost, I think, every year since the festival started. And uh, I've met a lot of great people at the festival. And uh, today we have some wonderful guests that have come in from, uh, well, worldwide, with people from LA, New York, Toronto, and locally here from Kansas City. I'm going to start with Laura and introduce and say a little bit about uh, what you do and, and some of the people. Great. So my name's Laura Good. I work at the Toronto International Film Festival. Um, my full-time role is actually for a division called Film Circuit, which is our programming outreach division. And it has an interesting relationship with distribution. It actually helps us reach um, 200 independent cinema groups that we work closely with on a year-round basis across the country, across Canada. And um, so we're sort of a marriage between programming, distribution, and exhibition. We work with major chains and the major distributors in Canada um, to help get sort of independent and festival caliber films to communities across the country. I also screen for festival, um, pass on films to programmers. And uh, I'm Red Simmons, and um, primarily I'm a producer. Uh, working with independent filmmakers. Um, I produced uh, the Cormac McCarthy, The Road. Um, I did uh, the first season of uh, HBO's Boardwalk Empire. I did a, a, a musical across the universe with Julie Taymor. I produced um, Life Aquatic and uh, Royal Tenenbaums for Wes Anderson. Um, High Fidelity, Dead Man Walking, which was a long time ago. Um, and I'm here at the festival uh, with a, a feature-length documentary that um, I uh, directed and produced um, that's doing the circuit right now. So <coughs> I guess maybe what I can end up adding is um, kind of a, a real independent filmmaker's point of view to finding distribution. Uh, you should leave now. <laughs> uh, my name's Ken Dubow. I am a distributor. Um, I have my own distribution company. It's been in place about three years. I've done this for over 30, the studios, multinational, myself, all different sorts of things. In this, in this present incarnation myself, um, I specialize mostly in television product. I do occasional theatrical stuff, um, but uh, I'm really trying to bring mostly what clients are looking for. <laughs> you have to talk to me. It's not an easy road out there. Yeah. It's a tough road either day. Uh, my name is Dennis Fallon. My company is Waldo West Productions, and I'm a producer and director. Uh, made many films. Um, everything ever, I've ever done has been in distribution uh, all over the world. I've worked with these guys, you know, for 15 years, putting things together. And um, right now, I'm sort of in hiatus, getting ready to. Uh, to probably announce something, as Peter and I were talking here pretty soon uh, for the area, but I'm here, I think they brought me on because I'm from the filmmaker side, I've, I've dealt with you know all the major companies, all the studios, and all my films, like my last film, Sony has it, uh, from a theatrical standpoint and a DVD standpoint. And uh, I've written a book on how to, how to raise money for your films and how to get distribution, so I think that's why they had me on this panel today. And I'm a local guy. We have an office in LA, and we're also here. So, great. Well, let's let's start off, uh, and each one of you can address this. About at, at what point do you think the distribution, uh, whether a producer or a distributor, do you think the contact with a distribution company should happen? Is uh, your opinion referring to at the beginning, once you've completed? Uh, at what point do you interact with? Well, coming from my biased opinion of being in the festival context, we prefer um, we prefer to take on a film when it doesn't have distribution because we're getting a film basically at its peak premiere status. <coughs> um, having said that, it can be a little more complicated for us when there is a distributor attached. So that can be advantageous in a lot of ways because it often 
I mean, clearly you're not going to turn down a distribution deal, but if you don't have it, you tend to get a better time slot and more preference um, in the festival. Um, also, it's a great place to either get a sales agent or begin those discussions. So, be my two cents. You know, I'd, I'd love to hear what these guys have to say first. Okay. Let me, yeah. If you don't mind, I mean, because okay. this is you really about sure. I, you know, what do you, I think you, the best films in this world are the ones that are pre-sold. Um, that have distributors on for right from the beginning. Um, they they are the most profitable uh, invariably. Um, they also fit because you're 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 producing. You worry you have client approval already on casting. You have client approval on on the script. You have all sorts of approvals that have gone along in the in, in the filmmaking process. And maybe you're building a little bit of a camel, but um, you know trying to trying to have a horse. But in, in the other sense, you're also getting to you're getting to something that's going to be more commercial um, out there. I mean, I, I over the last couple of years, my, my eldest daughter works for a company in, in um, L.A. called Screen Engine, and Screen Engine is one of the three big research companies the studios use for their films. And I see them dropping quarter million dollar checks to research a film because they want to know they want to know leading in what's going on. They want to know that weekend what's going on. They want to know coming out, where, coming out of the theater, what's going on with the film because they have so much invested in it. And you, as filmmakers, I, I think should really just think the same way um, that that you in, that this is what you want to do. That that you have a client, and you have a client at the other end in in terms of what you're producing, and you have somebody who's going to want to see this film when it when it's finished. I know it's not always the case. And you can wind up with, with you know, you've made some absolutely incredible films. Um, and, and um, you know, the, you don't, the road wasn't sold everywhere when, when they produced, but it was also based upon. Well, actually, no, we, we had. Did you uh, have a lot of pre-sales? We had um, the, the uh, uh, domestic. Domestic. Yeah, I mean, there was a company that actually put up the money to develop that. It's called 2920. Right. Uh, and, and they had, they went into principal photography with no distribution deal. And then the Weinstein. Can, can we say that, that, yeah, that 2920 is Mark Cuban's Mark company? Yeah. So he can write a check. Mark, Mark Cuban is, was a, a, is a billionaire.com. And he wanted to get into the movie business. So he, and he's also extraordinarily confident, as you can tell from Shark Tank. Where he's one of the hosts. Of the show. Just to see him on Dallas sidelines. <laughs> anyway, he, he actually he has a company, and he, he had a producer on staff, and he wanted to make the movie, and um, we figured we could make that movie for twenty million, uh, tw for twenty million, it would be a negative cost, and for him that was right at the outer limit, but he was coming off a couple successes, and he gambled thinking that he could, with the stars that he had, and et cetera, et cetera, he could do really well with not only domestic, but European. Now what happened was the Weinstein stepped in, they had expressed interest, Weinstein Company stepped in, had expressed interest. He thought he had a distribution deal because the Weinsteins were with Warner Brothers at the time. Mm -hmm. But as the contract was signed and we started shooting, Warner Brothers <coughs> dropped the Weinsteins. So now all of a sudden, Mark doesn't have the domestic deal that he has, and none of the European pre-sales are being picked up. So he was in a pretty tough position. He was, he was, yeah. See, even a billionaire can wind up in wind up in a tough position on a movie based we, on a famous book. Too. Right. Can we explain to the guys? Do you guys understand what a pre-sale is? Everybody in the audience understands. Yeah, that's a good point because a lot of people don't. understand. It's just buying the movie before it's exactly. made. Yeah, I just want to make sure that. You know, I, Sorry, I, I, one of the things I always kid about with, with when we, we go to markets and well, who attends a market screening? You know, so producers always want me to go, can you show my movie at the market, okay? And you wind up with maybe three or four people in the audience for market screenings. When people go to market screenings, it's either the movie has been incredibly impactful someplace else and everybody wants to see it and, and um, whether they can buy it or not, or they have all pre-bought it and they want to see what they got. And that's that's that's... That's what you wind up with 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 that at these market screens. If, if you don't mind me just kind of jumping in, because I agree with everything you're saying to a certain extent, which we'll go to later. But even who, does anybody here know who Jim Jarmusch is? Sure. Okay. I, even a, a, an absolutely independent filmmaker like Jim Jarmusch, who who believe it or not owns his negative, 
Mm, you know, so he owns his own negative. He will do that because when we were making the early Jarmish movies, what we did is we pre-sold just enough territories to cover the negative. Mm -hmm. And we were very lucky because in those very, very early films, Jim had developed a following in Japan with Stranger Than Paradise, where he was able from JVC to pre-sell Japan for two and a half million dollars, which is huge. Yeah, that's huge. And, and then on Mystery Train, which was the second one, uh, we were able to cover the additional cost with Roberto Benigni, who was now who was Italian. Now, in the early days, I thought Jim was this amazing, I, I've known him for a long time, I thought he was this amazingly independent director who was going out in the world doing exactly what he wanted to do. I realized later that he cast to his pre-markets. Mm -hmm. So on, on, um, on Down by Law, he cast Roberto Bignini for Japan, I mean for, for Italy, mm -hmm. and he knew he had Japan, and he knew he had the hipster crowd with John Woody and Tom Waits. Then later, on Mystery Train, he cast two of the biggest stars in Japan, which you know guaranteed him those rights. And then on, um, on um, what was the name of it? It was Night on Earth, which was set in five cities around the country. We cast the star in each one of those cities, which were territories. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a very, very, I'm not saying he's not an independent, because he is, but it was a very, very savvy marketing approach. So even with Jim, who's like the uber um, independent, we didn't start principal photography until we had enough distribution wrapped up yeah, to do the pre-sales. Yeah. Wow. There's too many people make too many movies without any, any sales in place. That's true. Well, well, there's another point to that, too, because I agree with you 100%. You do, it's much better to have everything in place before you go out shooting, especially with all your pre-sales and you got your money. You know you're going to deliver your territories and everything's fine. But on the other hand, isn't it also whoever that distributor is? Because if you're if you're in the process of making a film and you don't have a bigger uh, distribution company, you've got a company that maybe can't deliver it the way someone else does, and your film that you're making ends up being much better than you ever anticipated being. And now you have a much bigger, you're holding now a great film, but you have a, a lesser quality distributor that can get it in the places you so that's another thing you weigh, but ultimately it's your way I don't better know if, I don't know if I agree with that because I'm big believer. I had a situation like that, yeah. and uh, yeah, and of course I went from uh, one distributor was like, they wanted me to make this film, and I'm like, okay, we'll make it, but we never signed a deal with them. Uh, we just thought, we just talked about, hey, you guys make it, and we want to do this, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to sign it, but we decided we want to go make it, because I own all my own negative. We finance our own films. Mm -hmm. We've done, we've always financed them. And <clears throat> I'm glad it did, because they would not have, you know, Sony has the picture now, but they wouldn't have been able to, I was, I was in Wichita, Kansas the other day, I walk in and everywhere I go, I see my films on the shelves. So it's nice to still have your product sitting on the DVD shelves mm -hmm. today when nobody's buying DVDs, but that product still mm -hmm. is, is out there on a regular basis. So, but yes, probably 99% of the time, it's mm -hmm. always better to have that in place if you if well, you well, the two different types of distributors a sales agent who may or may not be able to get things done for you and then there are the distributors in the local territories who are that's what they do they're basically in their retail di distribution business and I get a lot of filmmakers who say to me well, I don't want to sell it early what if they, what if it turns out really good and the deals that you, you do as I try to explain are minimum guarantee deals where in success you're going to see royalty checks absolutely and and so you you're not you're not screwing yourself. You're financing your film, no. and you're covering your your, your proverbial behind. That's what I was saying. Ninety nine percent of the time, this is always the way to go. Yeah. That was a little like the one you know one percent maybe that would make a difference. But now you're I, I, you're bringing up a very interesting point that you kind of touched on, and that is that if you have a distributor early in the game, whether it's in the development process with the script whether or not you've put a package together and you've gone to the distributor ahead of time, whether or not you've pre-sold the territory. What happens is the distributor becomes part of the filmmaking team. So what, what is now happening is it's not just 
a widget that they bought that they're going to put out into the world, which, quite frankly, you buy it one year, and the following year, the market may have shifted, and they may no longer be interested in it. Yeah. But if the distributor comes in early, and they start <coughs> making some of those, or being involved in making some of those creative decisions, who the cast is, uh, long-term planning on the marketing campaign, uh, maybe even notes on the script, now they've got a vested interest. It's not just a widget that they bought. It's a film that they were actively making. And I can't help tell you how important it is that every aspect of your team, whether it's in the production process or post-production or distribution, when people are involved in the making of the film and when they feel as if they're being listened to, that will go so far in turning those people into champions of your film, which is exactly what you need once you get out there. Yeah, everyone takes ownership in the product, and when you yeah. do that, it's a, it's a team, like you exactly. said. Exactly. Exactly. Now, my documentary is a very, very different situation, and this was a film that I made. I did it, you know, I did it all as self-financed, and I purposefully did not go to a distributor in the beginning because I wanted to make it in a certain way, and I knew that if I went to an HBO or a PBS, what would end up happening is that they would want me to do something different in the way that I was going to make it. And because of where I am professionally, I had the luxury of actually being able to do that. Now, I'm now in a situation where I'm looking for a distributor which means that I'm doing the festival circuit, I'm going out to the festivals, I'm setting up screenings myself, I'm trying to build uh, a market recognition, which brings into play all of um, the new electronic online distribution that so many people are talking about, uh, which I don't, know, I don't know whether or not you're gonna cover that, but, but I think the important, there, there's so many different ways of distributing a movie right now. Uh, there are websites that you can go and distribute it yourself. You know, you can build all kind of recognition on social media. Uh, and there's so many routes of getting a distribution deal outside of the traditional way. The problem, and, and there's not one panel that I've heard address this, the problem with the new media as an independent filmmaker is, it means that I just finished five years making my movie. If I'm gonna distribute it myself, then I've got a full-time job for two, three, four years. And that's seven years on one movie. Well, I have a job I have to do, and I'm hoping to make more movies, so I don't really want <laughs> to go out and have to do this myself. And, and so I think there's a price either way, whether you go with the traditional distribution route or whether you distribute it yourself. It's very hard. I think you're touching on a point that it's very hard to be a producer and a distributor. They're really, they're, they have 24-7 jobs separately. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that was one of the things, uh, when I was getting at the question about uh, uh, at what point do you get involved with distributors, um, I was getting to that of, of the people the distributor get involved with and knowing uh, who are those distributors. And for instance, Ken, I mean, if someone's to look up, I mean, the companies you've been with, your reputation, the things you've been, uh, is a very quality, high, highly reputable distributor that, that knows the business. And a lot of people don't, you, you gotta know. I mean, everyone, you know, they know the big distributors, the Warner Brothers, the, the big studios, and, the, and, the, and Weinsteins, but they don't know the, the, the next level of, of independent distributors that are out there that know the business and it's really important because for instance his contact his buyer uh, buyers that he deals with he knows what they're looking for he knows how to steer your production with casting and different elements so it'll be sellable and you'll be able to make money and that's one of the things that uh, I think I think you also have to find the distributor for a sales agent slash distributor who fits your movie, right? Who fits what you're, you know, whether it's a documentary, a fifty million dollar film, a million dollar film. We all we all inhabit as sales agents or distributors 
and the different types of distributors. We talk about the studios and stuff. They are really, or I sell the studios. I sold the movie to Warner Brothers last year. They're in, they're in the, the distribution business. We're in the brokerage business as, as distributors. We broker those deals between, but I'm bringing, as, as, as dist distributor, I'm bringing 30 plus years of doing this and experience and, and of, of uh, knowing people. Because when you get to these, you get to these festivals and markets, it's all appointments. You don't have appointments, you don't see people. And it may look like chaos, but it's to me it's it's chaos either on every half hour or chaos on the hour, depending upon when you're seeing people. Well also let them know that <clears throat> a person like Ken, for instance, I I have relationships that I can talk to the studios, but you can't you, a lot of a lot of filmmakers like I want to get my film to the studio, they, they won't accept it. If you send it to them, they're gonna send it back. You need someone that has a relationship with them, <laughs> or an agent, or sales agent, to get your product in there. They all so have acquisition. They all have acquisition. 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 You, know, acquisition you can get on the phone and call them, and they'll say, hey, I'm sorry, uh, we don't take it. You need to bring it in with a sales agent or somebody that we work with, because they won't accept it unless you have a personal relationship. I, two, two points about this. One is community, the other is research. When you're getting ready to make a movie, I think, you know, you're, you're gonna research your topic if you're doing a documentary, you're gonna research any background material if you're gonna do, if you're writing a script. I think when you have a script and you're ready to make your movie, and now I think one of the most important things you can do is to research all the other movies that have been made in the last, say, three years or five years that are similar to yours both in budget, in uh, the subject matter, in uh, the market, who, who the audience is supposed to be. Find out, and I mean, with, with the internet now and with DVDs, there's so much uh, uh, information available. Find out who distributed that movie, who produced that movie, who was the sales agent on that movie, how did they raise their money, how did they get their distribution, what was their distribution plan. As, as filmmakers, we live in a world now, whether you're a producer or a director, you have to take responsibility for your movie. You can't just simply say, oh, I'm a director, this is a producer's job. You have to be a champion for your film, even when the distributor comes on. Um, that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is community. And I think that if, if you, you have to know the people who make movies in the community you live and work in. So for instance, if you're, if you're making movies, if you live here in Kansas City and, and you're starting out, this is where you want to make your movie. This is where you want to set your movie with these people. You want to make your movie with people you know or that you can branch out on. You don't want to bring in outside people. You want to look to who are the sales agents, the business people, the financiers here in Kansas City. Because with your first film, these, this is the network that you're going to build. And then, as you grow as filmmakers, and you move past that, but this is where you need to begin. And so I think with research and building a network of people, it's absolutely important in the beginning stages. Yeah, it, it seems like, uh, I think for most like indie filmmakers, especially startup filmmakers, uh, there's kind of, the, it seems like there's this gulf between, on one hand, what usually becomes the strategy is try to get your movie done, get it into Sundance or Toronto, and then pick up a sales agent and sell it. Um, and then of course there's the other end of what you guys talked about of pre-sales and having the strategy from the beginning and being able to package it before you even start shooting. How, how likely is it that you could do anything like the the probably obviously preferable one of having pre-sales and finding distribution before you even shot it, it if you're an indie yeah, filmmaker. Happens, that's how you do it. That's how most of the business works. Really? Yes. Uh, well, yeah, yes and no. Yeah. It's sort of like pre-sales are like a credit card in a little way. You have to have sort of you, you, the, the first thing question I get from theatrical distributors and markets is who's in it? So they, you've got to have you got to have star value in terms of who's in it. But even a movie like The Road, you had star value based upon a very very big book, 
it's still hard to pre-sell because everyone wants to move. How am I going to turn that book into a movie? Yeah. And and they they want to see they want to see it first. So it is hard. You know the easier movies to pre-sell the Expendables. Um, <laughs> that's seriously that's those those are the types of films that 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 generally something with Jason Stratham or or that, that summer movie with uh, the kids did you know the phone camera that came out a couple of months ago. It was about, it was the storyline was parents go away. We're gonna have a party. Oh well, yes, 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 yes. The, yeah. the, 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 the um, I forget X X, 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 X Factor X Factor. X Factor. X Factor. Yeah. X, Project X. Yeah. Project X. Project X was one who's pre bought that. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's, it's they didn't, easy to sell. They easy to sell. They didn't. They didn't spend a lot of money on it. Um, you know that's that's some of the studios like Paramount now has a division called Insurge. Which is specializing in really because they did so well with Paranormal Activity and they they just released the other one the the Possession one so they there are people doing but the whole concept of pre-sales is who's in your movie who are your other attachments elsewise it's really it, it is it is hard to sell a lot of the pre-selling I do are like aren't necessarily theatrical films the Lifetime films. And so they right. know it's already, it's gonna be on Lifetime, it has this TV star, that TV star, and so the big broadcasters in Europe pick it up because it has, it's, it's got a cachet in a different way. Sure. Um, I, I'd like to just comment on the question. Um, first of all, you know, I'm, a, I'm answering this as the film that you're talking about is a feature film because shorts are completely- Oh, totally, totally, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But as a feature film, I think, that it's, it's very imperative, it's imperative that as a filmmaker, if this is your first movie, that when you have your script and you're ready to move out, yeah, do you try to find a distributor? Do you try to find a sales agent? I think you go all of those ways. You know, you go all, and you look at what the pros and cons are of every option, and you start the traditional way, and you do the very best you can, and then if that doesn't work for you, you start figuring out what, what's the other way I could do this. Hmm. And the most important thing is that you make the movie. So as a first time filmmaker, the most important right. thing is that you get the movie made. So you go the route and you do all your research and you try to get it out there and find a distributor. Now let's say that doesn't work. Then you retreat and you say, okay, what are my resources? How much money can I realistically raise and give yourself a time? You know, figure out, really be honest about it, and then try to make your movie for that amount of money. So many independent filmmakers end up, especially documentary filmmakers, end up spending all of their time raising money. Right. Instead of saying, okay, I know I can get, with, with all my friends who are lawyers and dentists, I can get $100,000. <laughs> no, I'm serious, I'm serious. I can get $100,000. Okay, first time movie. How can I make a movie for $100,000? Well, I have that friend who has the house on the lake, right. you know, and you go and you go that way. You figure out what your resources are, and you make the movie, and you make the best movie you can. So, looking for a distributor, I wouldn't say should stop you from making your movie. Now, after you've done one movie and you've gotten it out there and you've gotten a distributor or not, then you have to really ask yourself, you know, do I want to do this again? Without a distributor? <laughs> But I think, I think you know, it's, it's very intimidating as first time filmmakers when, when we sit here and we talk about these things and you think, oh my God, how in the world am I gonna make my movie and do all of that? You know, I do think it's important to make your film. I, I think one of the things you should also do is show up at markets. At, don't be, if you really wanna be a filmmaker, invest and come to Cannes. Mm -hmm. Invest and come to Toronto. You're investing in yourself. You will you will gain so many business cards, so many contacts. It will you'll just come back on that airplane and go, boy, that was worthwhile. No, it's a good point because what I found early on is if you have an idea and you figure out how to pitch it, everyone will take a meeting until they find out you don't. Have <laughs> but but nobody knows where the next hit's going to come. They're from. all going to listen. Nobody knows. So. If you're a newbie and you have an idea and you learn how to pitch, you'll get a meeting. You'll get a lot of meetings. Well, also, too, like at your point, every sales agent, every distributor, every studio is going to be a can at the market. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you're yeah. going to be able to walk up and it's talk. It's really to good market. investment. Yeah. 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 Although, tell them, Ken, if you go to a market, the first few days are the busy days to do business. So what you 
want to do is if you don't have a limited time and you can go to CAN, your best time to meet with sales agents and distributors is towards the end of the market because yeah. that's when they yeah. have the free time. At the beginning, if you come to their booth, they're going to say, look, come back in a couple days, I'm doing business. Or find out, you know, the bigger sales agents and, and, and some of the, you know, the, the handways of the world, the IM Globals, mm -hmm. who are financing their own movies, big, bigger films. Um, what you want to do is you want to find out who the production executives are, seek them out like, like a heat-seeking missile, and make sure you have an appointment set up with them at the festival. It's also really useful to exploit the industry programming at any of these major festivals mm -hmm. with an industry component. I mean, it's a tremendous resource. I know at Toronto, it's basically two festivals in one. You've got the public festival and you've got the industry festival happening. Mm -hmm. And if you go and consult, anyone will take a consultation as a TIF employee who is working mm -hmm. in industry. They will tell you, they will give you the overview of North American or even Canadian, if you're interested in Canadian distribution, um, who are the players, who are the top three distributors, like UN Alliance, Mongo, what type of films they take, who are the independent distributors who are actually often a better fit for an independent film, how to meet with them, how to access that um, relationship. And the same way that you said when you pre-sell a film and you've signed on with a smaller distributor and then you realize you've got something different, it's evolved, it's a different beast. Um, the opposite can happen where you can sell a film to uh, one of the bigger distributors that isn't gonna do anything for it, um, that isn't yeah. gonna really support it. So sometimes- He doesn't really know the market. We see it happen all the time, and sometimes we think, was there a tax incentive? This doesn't yeah. make sense for Alliance to have this film. This yeah. is a Keynote Smith film, or for an American example, like an Icarus film. Um, yeah. It should be with a boutique distributor. And so, I don't know, in my opinion, I think maybe that filmmaker should have done their research as to what uh, that company had done for films that were comparable in the past, because it did sort of get buried, that specific example. Um, but really, really use those resources because they're there to help you get your films well, get sold. At least you hope your advance covers the cost of the film. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then my question would be then, this um, industry side of, of Toronto, um, questions that I would have like, you know, talked about, well, you take your package, what's a package? What's in it? What are we, what are we, you know, obviously we haven't shot anything yet because we're trying to get advanced sales or whatever like that. So what, is, that's what we find out? What well, that, that depends. Is. If you're looking for pre-sales, that's a different ball game. I was approaching that as if you had not gotten pre-sale and you're looking oh, for okay. distribution if, and you brought a film to the festival, for instance. If you have an idea, keep it short attention span theater. Just do you know, one page. Don't just something. You keep it a few few paragraphs, and don't do nothing longer than that. If they want a script, they'll ask. Believe me, if people think you have a good idea, they're they they're just gonna be all over you. Do, do you keep prefer elevator a pitch, pitch or do you prefer something? I read. I, well, it starts with pitch. I mean, it depends on the movie. I mean, if it's meant to be theatrical, I want to read the script. Right. Uh, with Lifetime and Sci-Fi Channel movies, they start as one paragraph concepts. They they expand into full page, then they expand into eight to nine pages, and then they expand into the scripts, get polished once, twice, make the movie. And that process takes six months before you even get into production. So it just depends upon, it depends upon what you're, you're doing. If it's meant to be theatrical, I want to see the script, I, I want to see who's going to be in it, I want to see who the production team is. Well then the, the question being, because you had said, if you're going to sell it, you're going to distribute it, you, you want to be involved in that process of yeah. casting anyway. So. We don't necessarily need to know who's it, going to it, be in it. It depends on how far along the producer is okay. in, in, in the process of trying to get their movie cast or not cast. And the way you get the way you get movies cast in this world is you better have pay or play money, or just don't even bother. You better have money to, 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 to shut up the agent and say, here's money, and we're going to make this movie, and here's the pay or play money, and here's a check, and that will get you that will get your attention because agents and managers look at actors like cash registers. And that's all they, and, and just in the most basic sense, they love them, I'll give you a big hug, hug it out, you know, but they look at them like cash registers. And what I find with agents is that young agents start with lots of clients, and as they get older and, and get better, they find two or three of these, or maybe even just a one, an Adam Sandler, bing, and their whole life becomes that one person. I mean, the greatest example of it is, is Tropic Thunder with Matthew McConaughey running around. Right. <laughs> running around. And you're the man, here's your TiVo. Yeah. But, uh, so, I, I, I pitched a project to Universal, one of the, the a working type at Universal. And the, the way it went is I, I knew the development person there. 
But let's say I didn't know the development person, but I knew friends, so I got to that development person. The development person, uh, we were talking on the phone. She said, so, you know, what's, what's your idea? And I pitched the idea. I pitched the idea, it was like three sentences. And she said, um, wow, that's kind of great. Do you have a script? And I did, because, you know, there was a writer-director who had the script, he came to me, and I said, I'll send it to you. So I sent it to her, she read it, she liked the script, she flew the director and I out to LA and we sat down in a meeting. Now, the only thing we had was the script. We had ideas of who we wanted for stars. We had ideas of how much it was gonna cost. We had ideas of what kind of movies it was similar to, but we hadn't gone through all the work of preparing a budget and doing all this in writing, okay? It's conversational. So, so it's like a one-page ideas of, we think it's gonna cost around this, these are the people we kind of think we Not even a one-page, I mean, I pitched her the idea. It was all in your head, it wasn't? Yeah, I mean, we had talked it through, the director and I. So we go down and we sit down and we start talking, you know. And of course they say, well, do you have any ideas of who you want for the male lead? And we put a couple ideas on the table and then, you know, I said to Tim Bevan, who's the, the head of the company, I said, uh, but you know, you read the script, what do you think? And so, and it started a dialogue. Tim mm -hmm. had ideas, Liza had ideas, we did the same thing with, and what it, what it was is we had done our research, so we were able to basically conduct a conversation allowing them to enter in and being part of the process. And then, you know, so Tim said, well, how much do you think it's gonna cost? And I said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, what, what do you think uh, What do you think you could sell it for? And he said, I, 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 could you do it for 15? Of course, yeah, of course we can do it for 15. I mean, we'll figure it out if we get the 15. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's exactly it. It's, it's, we'll figure, figure it out. We'll figure it out. out. <laughs> You know, but it's a one-on-one, -on -one. right? And it starts with that initial contact. Now, like I said, I knew the development person, but let's say I didn't know the development person. Let's say she's a friend of a friend. It's the same process. I think too many independent filmmakers start with putting all this energy and money into this big package, and nobody's going to look at it. You know, I, in 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 mm. the doc um, in the doc class that I had a couple of hours ago, you know, I handed out a sheet that was an outline of the documentary. And at the very top was one sentence. And that one sentence was what the film was. And that was the pitch. So I think that you, know, you have to know your pitch, you have to do your research, figure out who you can get to. Certainly do not go to Khan and set up those meetings unless you have an idea. <laughs> you know, because you're going to blow it. <laughs> Yes, um, that's a good call. But yeah. you, you got to, and be aggressive. I, I can't tell you how many people come to our stand at, at, the, at all these markets and just, without an appointment, without anything, I want to talk to you, I want to talk to you. One, a documentary I found three or four years ago, uh, Manuel Jal, which we have talked about in a couple of things, I, because the guy came to me in Berlin and as I was packing boxes in the last days, he says, look, we've had terrific festival screenings, we're having a market screening tonight, please, 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 please come. And the movie wound up winning Tribeca. Yeah. Um, so. But sometimes you have to kind of get outside of your comfort zone. And I think yeah, that that's it. there's a way of being aggressive and there's a way of being aggressive. So Laura and I share a car from the airport. I don't mean to put yeah, you on the spot. But we share a car from the airport. Now, I don't know her from Adam. Never met her before. And <laughs> she gets in the car and, you know, chit-chat back and forth and we're talking. And then I find out she chooses films for various markets in Toronto that uh, independent films that would go out to markets that only show first run features. And I'm thinking, aha. Uh -huh. So, you know, I pull my business card out of my pocket and say, here you go, Laura, 645, you've got to come to my screening. Now that's a horrible thing. I felt so embarrassed. Yeah, she looked it's at, at the me. same time as my shorts program, by the way, six o'clock. <laughs> so she, she's looking at me like, uh, yeah. No, <laughs> but, no. but I'm looking at you like it's Wednesday. Right, right. But you know, it, it's now. I wasn't rude. I wasn't pushy. I hope not. I was. I was being as polite as I possibly could for a southern gentleman. <laughs> but the point is that if. It's expected, and if you don't do it, there's an opportunity that you may end up missing. Somebody else is going to do it if you don't. Yeah. Okay. That's, you had a question? Uh, so I have to ask, since you, you brought it up, maybe we could go back to it. Since I'm here representing a short, what distribution models or options or tasks are available for a short? 
I can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, you, you um, can speak better. I program shorts as well as features, and um, I think you really need to ask yourself on a philosophical level what you're trying to accomplish with your short. Is it a business card for a feature? Are you trying to get your name out? Are you trying to make connections? Are you trying to get to some of these top festivals? Because um, distribution isn't always the end-all be-all for shorts. In fact, it's hard to come by, and the films that do get it, it can sometimes hurt them. And um, which is to say, which isn't to say that you shouldn't pursue it because it, it's different for every film. It's a case by case situation. But for example, I have seen short films take on a distribution uh, agreement really early on in their life on the festival circuit that then inhibited them from uh, being in certain festivals and discouraged booking. For example, I book um, shorts at 200 venues across Canada and the unfortunate reality is that a lot of those short filmmakers waive their booking rights because they're still the owners of those rights because they know I can get them 200 bookings and get it shown and get their name out there and um, help create an appetite for that type of cinema and um, when I approach them with, oh well this, this film carries a $75 booking fee which is peanuts, they'll move to the next one. And it's an unfortunate reality um, and there are other ways to get sort of artist fees for screenings um, that are sort of an alternate mode of distribution. But I think with short films, you really need to mm -hmm. consider uh, what what outcome you want, whether it's monetary or whether it's a, a bigger picture. Yeah, I think monetary is almost impossible with short, short films. films. I think yeah. it is it is a, like you said a calling card for I can make a movie. And well, after you've played the festival circuit, you can always go to broadcast. I mean, that's something a lot of short filmmakers do. Or um, sometimes you'll be approached and turned into a compilation where that is then distributed. That's actually a lot more likely. Yeah. Uh, I was going to have a question that's actually related to well, Ken, if you don't mind. Yeah, so jump in. <laughs> uh, could I answer the short, or is it about Go ahead, because that's something else. Oh, okay. So, I, sorry. I, mean, um, I want to go back to Jim Jarvis, who is in, I think, a lot of us independent filmmakers are in his shoes. When Jim got out of film school at NYU, uh, he had worked for, uh, he had worked for Nick Ray, a director, Nick Ray, as a teaching assistant. And through Nick Ray, he met Ben Benders. Because Ben Benders, the German director, was doing a movie about Nick. And he became Ben Benders' assistant on that movie. There's your contact, okay, network. Then what Jim did is he wrote a short, 15 minutes long. Filmed it in 35 millimeter black and white, which was a, and in a very distinctive style. He based, he, he figured out, I have X amount of dollars in my pocket, I can make it for that kind of money. He then went to Ben Vendors and showed the short and pitched a feature that the short was the first act of. And Ben Vendors got it into the Cannes Film Festival. And at the Cannes Film Festival, Ben introduced Jim to a producer in Munich. And the producer came up to Jim and said, I love this, can you finish it as a feature for $100,000? And Jim said, absolutely. And the film was Stranger Than Paradise. So, you know, there's uh, sometimes shorts, if, there, if, if there's part of a plan, you can actually plan that the short is gonna be something more than just simply a calling card. I'm sorry, go ahead. Actually, no, that's, if that's we, a, just no, go before ahead. you do that, if I could squeeze in one more thing, we actually had a success story of that exact thing happen at last year's festival at TIFF. A short called Patchtown um, premiered at TIFF, and by the end of the festival, the short filmmaker ended up announcing on a panel of ours that he had picked up project funding and was turning it into a feature, so it happened. Yeah, well, there's another one, um, was it Marilyn Hotchkiss Ballroom, remember that one, Ballroom Dance? It was a short film, and then it became a feature film with John Goodman, and mm -hmm. right. uh, that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I was gonna ask you is, over the past three or four or five years, the industry has changed totally. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's different, and a lot of it just changes. changes so much that the fact that, I mean, what we used to get dollar per film, mm -hmm. you know, we're not even close. <coughs> And <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody would kill to get two million out of Japan right yeah. now. You know, but kill, <laughs> kill to get anything. I mean, just six figures out of Japan yeah. these yeah. days. Yeah. It's become so bad. But we used to. I mean, God, six or seven years ago, the money we got out of Germany, maybe a little bit more than that. It's just kept going down and down and down. And, and the industry, we always thought it's going to change. It's going to change, but it just still keeps getting lower and lower. 
So can you give us an assessment of where we are in the industry, the climate right now, and do you see is the bottom, if we hit bottom and we're going back, or are we still going down? Well, I think the industry goes through, you know, goes through this, and I don't think it, it, it's so much bottoming, it's just that what happened was you had a lot of people who got into the business as DVD, DHS distributors because they thought it was a good idea. They had, they were, they were stamping DVDs that, you know, and they were, oh, well, if you buy libraries, we can be in the DVD business. Well, it creates competition. Anytime you have more than one person who wants to buy something, you have a bidding war. So they overpaid for a lot of product and it, it came to haunt them. And what you're really seeing now are realistic prices. And when you go throughout Europe, um, in terms of the, the secondary markets of Europe, in terms of DVD and TV, I think they have permanently changed sort of like the United States where you have oligopoly positions of broadcasters, of large broadcasters who do a lot of business with the studios and leaves very little room for independent, independent, independent feature product unless it sort of, it's, unless it sort of rises up. Um, and then on the, with, with it comes to DVD, some of these countries, Spain, Italy, France, there's no DVD, it doesn't exist. It just doesn't, it's, it exists in, in the smallest, smallest ways because of piracy, because of the tradition, because of that, but you just go a little bit up to Germany, it's booming. So it just depends, it, it depends on where you are. And what we've also run out of the, in this world is places where there wasn't commercial broadcasting, video, it's all, all, all the markets have been opened up. And, and, and the markets that, that even I now have, um, the, even the places, people approach me from Vietnam, from Afghanistan, from Iran, IRIB approached me at MIP about buying some movies. Um, so you even have those little markets, but they're very little markets. And I mean, so you don't have all these entrepreneurs anymore spending too much money on too much stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and you have people who are serious about their businesses and they know what they need, they know what they want, and they're only gonna pay you what they think they can get out of it. And what it has done is that prices are much, much lower. I mean, Japan is a great example. Japan has just continues to go down and down and down. And now, so many movies that are theatrical just go without selling. And to reach six figures on a movie in Japan is so difficult because they can't release it theatrically. Um, in, in their country, and it's, um, you know, Jim has a, he's got a bit of a Well, that was, I mean, you know, following, but that was, that was also a very, very unique time. Yeah. Because How that was, ago, was but this, we're, we're talking the early 80s. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. It was very this different, was, different, yeah, different yeah, world. I age myself, but, but, you know, that, that was the beginning of the, the independent film movement. Yeah. Yeah. Where the minute you were in the middle of your footings, VHSs in the blockbusters in the world, it changed. Yeah. It changed. That's where AFM became. It became. It became much, much more. I mean, I started in this business in U.S. syndication when they started giving out TV signals all in the early '80s, and they just gave out all these signals, and all these television stations signed on all over the country, and we sold them all product, and they all went bankrupt. And then Murdoch, <laughs> they became Fox stations and CW stations, WB stations. The same thing happened in Europe. The same thing happened all over the world where the, the government said, let there be commercial broadcasters. They grew up and now, you know, France is two buyers, Spain is two buyers, Italy is two buyers. That's it in broadcasting. And it makes it very tough. And the theatrical markets in these countries for Western product, because there's so much product coming from their own countries, is tough. That's what makes Japan tough, mm -hmm. is there's a lot of Japanese movies and there's a lot of Korean movies. Korea is tough because there's a lot of Japanese movies and a lot of Korean movies. <laughs> it's just the opposite, and it makes it very tough for things that are culturally Western to resonate with them, unless it's Transformers or, mm -hmm. or, or something, you know, they cost 200 million to make. Well, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine that because the means of making a movie have become so much cheaper now, that pretty much anybody who wants to make a feature film can buy a prosumer camera and make one. So now, there's just so, so much product, quote unquote. Right, it's too much product. It's too much product. It's too much product. It's too, it's, you know, how many, how many entries does TIFF get? Thousands. Thousands of thousands. movies. Thousand to pick a couple hundred. I watched a thousand Last year, now, what that means, yeah. what, what that means, I think, to all the filmmakers in this room is as you're planning your film, you have to look and see in the market right now what other kind of films are out there that are similar. Now, how can I make my film 
completely different from what they're doing. No, I'm serious. You're right. How many vampire movies are there out there right now? You know, if you're going to make a vampire, well, first, don't. But if you're going to make a vampire movie, what can you do that's going to take that genre and turn it on its head in such a way that your film is going to stand up head and heels over everything else in the festivals in the marketplace? I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna come up with a documentary, then what can you do that's gonna make that groundbreaking? Either in the way you're telling your story, or in in the cause it's supporting. You know, you've either you've got to make your film visible in some way, and we can't all afford Bruce Willis's. You know, and that's that's what you know. You put a Bruce Willis on a movie, there's an audience that's already built in. So look at your movie figure out how you can make this completely different from everything else out there, and then look at what kind of an audience it's gonna have. And I don't wanna tell people to start tailoring their movies to audiences, but I, I think that's a very important it thing. Is, it is, really, you, you be tailored to yourself. You, you say a very important word, I mean, we call it comparatives in the business. I mean, the investment of $150 in IMDb Pro for any filmmaker is a very important thing because you're able to look at a lot of facts and a lot of a lot of numbers and do comparatives. And don't compare your movie and say, look, I did Napoleon Dynamite made this. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make that. Don't compare. You know, I see so many, so many um, uh, prospectuses for raising funds where all they do is they compare it to really, really, really successful movies, and I go, that's great, that's great. It, it, Chances are it's not going to happen. So the point is being of, of look at the genre. Look at the genre. Look what you're making. I, you know, you say turn vampire. Turn the vampires on their head. I can't wait to see Abraham Lincoln vampire. Right. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am yeah. psyched to go. See. I don't even know what it's about. I'm psyched. I yeah. saw the poster. I said that looks yeah. cool. That's cool. The title in itself is the pitch. That, that's right. So yeah, it does. It uh, you know there are movies. Uh, Twenty eight days later, turned turn the whole idea of zombies wow. on its ear. Um, if you can, if you come up with a great concept to turn something on its ear, you're gonna, you're gonna do well. Yeah. yeah. Shaun of the Dead. Boy, Shaun of the Dead Shaun turned it, turned, turned yeah. it on its ear too. Yeah. That's good. Uh, more questions out there. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, since there's a kind of been a switch from DVD to more like the iTunes, uh, just your movie, whenever you want to see it, however you want to see it. Like, how will that affect distribution? Or what are your guys' thoughts on how that will affect distribution? I mean, I'm seeing more and more deals now. I've placed about eight movies just for straight DVD in the US, and um, I find that now people release it digitally first, and if it does well, they go DVD. And if it doesn't, they don't bother. Um, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. And, they, and some of these deals these days, they won't promise you the DVD releases. They will release it digitally, if it performs, we'll, we'll take the risk on the disc. Now that's an important point because case study for me, I was approached by Whole Foods and they're putting together a, a series of movies and they release them one a month. <coughs> you know, and they want Whole to know foods. if I'm interested. Whole Foods? Whole Foods. Whole Foods. Really? Yes. So and they're trying to do, a, I don't know what the road. Trying. No, 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 no. <laughs> Great, the cannibals on parade. Uh, so, but, but, okay, so I look at this, and they're pitching it, oh, it's gonna be great, there are a lot of people who are gonna see this, but I'm thinking, now wait a minute, so if I put this out there, and it's been streaming online, how's that gonna affect a distributor? Who's gonna wanna buy something that, ideally, is fresh product that nobody else has seen, right. that he can then, make a big noise out of and put it out online. Well, I've already, you know, I've taken my $200 or whatever, and I've had my movie distributed for a full month in the United States and Canada for any and everybody to see. And I've gone out of my way to promote all of that. Well, all of a sudden, that's a market that I've diminished for a potential distributor. It can also hurt your um, theatrical sales if you have a film going too soon to uh, VOD or Netflix or whatever it is that you use, because it, that window is actually quite important in ancillary markets, because it's an incentive for people to get into the cinema. Um, so that's something I found interesting. And sorry, one more thing I just wanted to mention, I'll get to you. Uh, also, with the conversion to digital, another thing I thought I'd mention is that I've seen a lot of independent films do a lot better in Canada, personally, because of sheer availability, whereas independent films, for anyone that that's relevant to, um, and smaller films that are with like boutique distributors, in the past they can only afford to get four prints made for a ginormous country. 
And I mean, that's just that's just very difficult to get hundreds of bookings on just just in the organization I work with alone, um, where we book across the country. But a DCP is one hundred and fifty dollars yep. versus five thousand. So. In that way, um, a different take on digital. It's actually, I think, helpful for the distribution side with some of those tiny films. Mm -hmm. So that kind of begs a question in that a lot of people now, and, and we'll have a meeting later on this, but are turning to crowdfunding to build you know, the money for their, their films. And almost inevitably, every single crowdfunding campaign is buy a copy of the film on DVD. And the question is, when do you ship the DVDs? How does that affect getting into festivals? Well, How does that affect I wouldn't, I wouldn't get into your own, your own manufacturing DVD festival, DVDs. The only crowdfunding movie I've seen work so far, which is, I think Anchor Bay's bought for the US, is Iron Cross, which is a Swedish-made comedy about Nazis who go to the go and after World War II go live on the far side of the moon, <laughs> and they come back and they it was about fifteen million dollar production. It's very I saw it in Berlin. It's it, it's it's got moments. It's got some serious Sarah Palin president. It's got a black a black astronaut who confronts the, the Nazis. It's got some moments, um, and it's it's very comical. But it they raised about three million dollars online. It took them two years to do. Um, I don't know if that really works. I, I, I wouldn't get into the manufacturing of DVDs. I'd hold on to all your rights. I would just, just because you, you say a very important thing. If the second you start giving away rights, you've diminished your product. So if you're gonna go to a Whole Foods, it's gonna, Whole Foods is gonna cut you, you know, like, like I think in the music business, Starbucks for a while was in the music business. Mm -hmm. they, they dropped out of the music business because they found it really wasn't a profitable business for them. But if somebody's going to do that, and you had a musician who says, well, I'll just sell through Starbucks, because Starbucks was writing a big enough check. If Whole Foods writes you a big enough check, then you know what? Run with the money. Hey, go take it. Go. Right. But, but uh, you know, I think what you're going to find, and you're talking about a Kickstarter. I yeah, think, right? but I mean, yeah. and most of these movies that you know, you're talking about, you know, $50,000 budget, yeah. $75,000, really, have, you know, they can raise that on those platforms. Yeah. And the, like I said, it's how much do you dilute what you can, because ultimately I'm sure what they all want to do, I know what I want to do is I want to get this in at festivals, I want to try and find a distributor. But here's the thing. Here's how do thing. I hurt myself by shipping DVDs to people who I don't, I don't know what the deal is with Kickstarter, okay? But let's say if you're selling DVDs when you finish the movie, mm -hmm. if, if you read the fine print for a lot of festivals, um, they're going to request a premiere. Oh, so, for right. instance, Sundance that wants to make sure that your that the premiere is a worldwide premiere. A lot of festivals require that it be a statewide premiere, and just about every festival, if it is has been released on video or streaming, they don't want it's it. over. You'll have yeah. destroyed your premiere status. I mean, yeah. some that Sundance actually will take like a North American premiere. And well, in some cases, even something like that. Kickstarter, you can set your own terms. I mean, you could put on there, you know, buy, spend $25, yeah. $30, get a copy of my DVD, but you're not getting it until after we've submitted to festivals and well, stuff like that. Let's say you submit it to your festival and it goes huge, and all of a sudden Harvey Weinstein wants to buy your movie, but you have this contractual obligation that, you know, a part of this is going to go to Kickstarter. Well, he may still take it, but at the same time, that's a little piece of the pie that you no longer have available. So see, I think on those though, you're just, I mean, if you get a couple hundred people that give you some money, you're just giving that individual a burned DVD. Kickstarter, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's like a casting crew. Yeah, it's just, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's you, you know, not really people selling don't necessarily always want to just you're not money, selling give you anything. money. So you're saying, I'm gonna give you a little bit of value by sending you a copy of the movie on DVD. You know, well, it's some sort of burn in on there because all of a sudden, yeah. I, I will tell you this. I will tell you this <laughs> that uh, buyers go to these festivals. They, well, let's take Sundance for instance. Every independent buyer in the world wants to go to Sundance and see those movies and bid on them. Every company that has uh, distribution or producers rep. They're dying to get hold of the DVD of what's going to what festivals so that if they can find something that they want before the festival starts, they'll make a deal and buy it ahead of time. If those DVDs are out in the world, they'll get out there. They'll get out there. And those companies are going to find it. And, and I would say 99% of the time, 
they're going to look at it and somebody's going to say, oh, this sucks. And you know what? That word then gets out there. And all of a sudden, your movie sucks to everybody in the industry, whether they've seen it or not. And, and if you say, say you send a DVD to one of your investors, now he's got, he's got a 16-year-old son who really doesn't care about you, and he says, ha-ha, and he uploads it to the, out, onto YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just, once it gets out of your control, it's yeah. out of your control. Right. And so, but I'm just saying, you've gone through all your other methods of, try, of trying to resell the movie. Right. It didn't work out on your first time or whatever. It didn't work out, so you're raising funds on your own. You go to a Kickstarter, and, and what I think I'm hearing is, if you're going to promise to ship somebody a DVD, it's, you need to make it clear that it's going to be a year or two down the road yeah. after it's gone through everything that you want it to go through. And when hopefully, it, it becomes, I'm going to go to Walmart, buy copies of it, and ship that. You tell them, you promise them, you'll invite them to the premiere, and you'll get a finished good. Yeah. You'll get yeah. a finished copy. Or, or give them a DVD when it becomes commercial. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Hopefully, I go to Walmart, I buy it, and then I ship that to them. There are actually other incentives you can do too. I know an independent filmmaker right now doing something really innovative where they're selling aspects of the film, just, you know, not actual aspects of the film, but prop pieces, for example. Like they're, they're making a film that takes place in a high school and they say, mm -hmm. buy an extra $500 donation, give this character some classmates, give her a little brother. Right. That's a full other character that got cut from the budget. Buy it's $5,000. It's, it's actually them, really yeah, innovative. $250 they will give you an ID. People are buying IMDb credits like crazy. For 10,000, right. go to their house and cook You'll get a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be innovative. And another thing I feel like I haven't heard anyone talk about at all as a, as a solution to sort of getting your development funding and getting off the production off the ground when the reality is you're not often not going to pre-sell the type of production that I think that you're asking about, right. which is, you know, low budget, right. a first time if not emerging filmmaker. Um, and in Canada, the answer is invariably government funding. And I know that it's here too. It's just hidden away. And you really do have to get your grant writing on and do your research. And there are thousands, if not millions, to be had. I mean, I've seen a million dollars be given to, and for like a MOW or a tiny little independent film, that's a lot of money, um, be given out of a well, you know, government this, funding. That's a very good point because what you're saying, I think, is leave no stone unturned. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, what, no matter what phase it is of your movie, leave no stone unturned. Look at look at past models of what look of what worked. Look at uh, contemporary models of what worked. Look for any kind of funding that may end up being available to you, and be aggressive about it. And major cultural organizations, also oh. not just government. Hmm. Just like Nike says, just do it. Just go for it. You know, go out there and make it happen. Yeah. That's what it all is about. I mean, they ask people all the time, how do you make your people ask me how you make I just go do it. You know, yeah. you go out and you make it happen. Going back to something you said in the beginning, are, are, are there people that actually going to the festivals and doing the short programs looking for a feature in the short programs? No, not really. Okay. To be to be totally honest okay. with you. So it's More it's, than it's the lightning in the bottle that you're talking about. Yes, or more than likely, that's coming out of someone taking the initiative, who's there as a short filmmaker, to go to one of our sessions that are five minute speed dating sessions mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of industry professionals and having a strong, concise elevator pitch and then getting a follow up meeting out of that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's, there are several steps. Again. It's not okay. just making production them. markets, all, um, the, all, these, yeah. all these different things that they do where they, festivals especially, are very good at putting filmmakers together with money. And, Producers and distributors, they it's, it's matchmaking. Yeah. You gotta be there though. Right. Right. You gotta do it. But Actually, Can has its what, third or fourth year. I got into it this year somehow miraculously, the Producers Network. Yeah, mm -hmm. Can's got Producers and Network. That's, that's Berlin's a got co production. Yeah. Only AFM doesn't have anything. Berlin's great too. Berlin's, yeah. Berlin's fantastic at it. But you know, I, I think too what I'm hearing is there is no one way. There is no one way of getting your movie made. I think that the important thing is. Look at what your resources are. And I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about people, I'm talking about places, I'm talking about, if you wanna make your movie, say, I wanna have shot this movie in, be realistic, 18 months, two years, you know? And then figure out how you can make it within that amount of time. You know, if, if, if you can't get into con, if you don't have the money or the resources or the connections to go to, you know, um, some of these film festivals, don't let that stop you. And you can often get a networking pass for very minimal that gives you limited yeah. access, but gives you access to a lot of the right things. And 
actually very literally, we have a program called Pitch This, where if you uh, pitch your feature and we choose it, you get development funding. And there you go. Is I mean, is Pitch This just for Canadians? No, it isn't. No. no. But there are some qualifying restrictions, and one of them is that you have had a short or a feature mm. um, relationship with the festival in the past. So a short filmmaker, for example, that was selected last year could come back and pitch a feature. Well, that, that's important. With all the festivals, they all they all sort of rise up. They're filmmakers. They start them, and they exactly. just keep rising them up, and really good ones rise up. Yep. And our veterans come back year after year, yeah. and people who first participated in our talent lab, which is our um, sort of industry incubator for emerging filmmakers. Um, the people who first attended are now doing master classes, a lot of them. I mean, Adam Egoin, as an example, David Cronenberg, so. One thing to keep in mind, we're talking <laughs> distribution. Uh, and I think nowadays it's, it's becoming more ex accepted as Festivals are a form of distribution. It used to be festivals or festivals and then there was distribution. And now that with all, with the internet and new forms of distribution, well, through the internet, it's actually a, an opportunity when you play, if you have a small film and you don't play big festivals, but you play regional festivals like this one, it's an opportunity to distribute your film. And some people, if they know their film doesn't have interest with, with distributors. Uh, there was a, a, a filmmaker here a couple, few years back, and he was selling copies of his DVD after the screenings, and he went around, he sold a lot, Front just doing it, because it was a specialty, it was, it was about <laughs> piano, a piano <laughs> maker. Uh, 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 company. Come out afterwards and sign and sell DVDs. Yeah, I mean, he bought these. Whatever it It's an alternative distribution, works, you right. know, and what you're doing, ultimately, what you have to think about, the, the big picture is creating a network. And if you create a network, you can take that next step. I think Rudd was saying, you take the, whatever the step that you can make, you take that step, and if you're successful at that, people <coughs> will notice that, that next step, and they'll, they'll pick up. If you, if you can sell 5,000 DVDs of your movie, someone's gonna take notice of that. They're gonna say, 5,000? Because that's a lot nowadays. If you can sell that many, it's, you know, it, there's, there, there must be something really good about that. It's going to take that, you know, it's going to make another step. So there are a lot of different forms of distribution pieces, the traditional. I think where it gets difficult and you have to watch out and you need to deal with professional sales agents and distribution people is outside your territory. When you step outside your, your the U.S. and even Canada, although, you know, North America is usually grouped as U.S. and Canada, Canada has a unique situation. You have to be aware of that. And, and those things, but you get to other territories, you need a professional that knows well, the You have to be recognized by the Treasury Department as an exporter. Are you going to go, you're going to wind up with all sorts of withholding taxes from countries. Mm -hmm. You're not going to collect a lot of your money. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> unless, 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 business, right? unless you're really, you're, there is, there's, it's called a Form 6166, and right. it, it recognizes you as a U.S. exporter, uh, not subject to double taxation. Mm -hmm. But this sort of delivery is complex. I mean, I laughed about it in the last symposium. I said, Cannes is my last chance to sell anyone before Toronto, and I spend the whole summer beating on people to take delivery and collect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't do make new sales. It's just, right. where's my money? <laughs> but that's, that's one of the things. You can, um, at markets, buyers, there's relationships, and that's why you need, they know the people. And a lot of things, it's relationships with the, the sales companies and the buyers. They want to, they're going to deal with the people they know they can deliver, and that's really important. Well, it's important appointments. It's all appointments at these festivals. So well, is. this is very interesting what you're bringing up. There, there's a, a documentary out uh, that doesn't have distribution yet. Uh, it's called um, Their Own Voice, and I think the title has changed, but it's about a school in New York City that uses a poetry program. Well, I know this doc. Yeah. Well, that, it's been around. It's been around. It's been around. Now, here's a documentary, and the, the makers of this documentary, I know that one of the directors is, has a couple of Academy Awards and some Emmys. They've got a great they, website. That, they've got a great website. website. Can't that find they distribution. Don't, no, they can't find distribution. But they, I know, well, I know the direct, one of the directors personally, but they have a website, they have a face page, all are very important. They have applied in the last 18 months, I think, to over 200 festivals. 
And this is not just random application, but looking at festivals and seeing which one can help qualify them for an Academy Award, which one will help get them into certain territories, which one will build some recognition. Out of that 200 some festivals, I think maybe they got into 20, you know, and but this is a, this is a good film. Um, but what's happening is every one of those festivals that they go to, more people see it, and word of mouth starts, and they're out there and they're trying to make it happen. They're setting up personal screenings, but you know, I don't know if they're gonna get distribution yeah, or not. It's a tough film. It's a tough film. It's a tough film. What's the title? In their, in, in their voices, yeah, yeah, it's, it's got a terrible title. In their voices, I think. Terrible. But you know, the thing, of, the thing of it is that it's a nice doc. Was a terrible title. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he, he's right that document uh, that uh, festivals have become a sort of market themselves. But I, I would, you know, I would get creative with it. So let, let's go back and say you've made your first feature, okay, and you spent a hundred thousand dollars and you made a vampire movie. Something like that. So, you know, okay, look at the festivals, all the potential festivals that you can get it to, and plan on going to each one of those festivals. Try to get on whatever panels they have. Try to speak. Try to get yourself as well as your movie known. In addition to that, start thinking about what other places can I get it out to just simply to get people seeing it, like yeah. you saw this film. So, for instance, you know, go, go to the university here in Kansas, go to the communications program and say, you know, I made this movie, you've got students that want to find out how to make a movie, I'd like to come and talk, I'd like to screen my movie and talk about independent filmmaking. Now I'm just throwing that idea out, but all of a sudden you've created another venue for the movie to get out into the world and for more people to know about it with the potential of, you know, finding out. Another good website to understand festivals is Without a Box. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's yeah. not required. It's, yeah, well, uh, who knows, who knows what, and because and, it'll just, it keeps you updated on what festivals are coming up, or yeah. deadlines, new ones, and you can just see, you, you just go to the website, you see what they're looking for, and you go, you know what, that fits my movie. Yeah. And the other thing, too, talking not just film festivals, is like vampire, campy stuff, like Comic Con, it's become. A, it's it's hard there, to be heard over the studios yeah. at Comic Con. Well, but but there are other things that come. You know, there's different. Uh, was there WonderCon? There's a, there's all kinds of. But that type of place, mm. there's smaller versions of that. If you have something that fits that, that's an opportunity to to go to your audience and let them know that that you have something and you know, do who, your who own. Who here? Who here has ever heard of Ted Hope? Ted Hope, okay, good, good. As independent filmmakers, you should all know who Ted Hope is. Ted Hope is a producer in New York. He started with James Seamus, who now runs Focus Features. They had a tiny, tiny little company, and they produced Ang Lee's early movies. Now, uh, Ted split off, he has his own company now. He has a blog and a face page that online, he is, he is, fascinated and really interested in trying to figure out how to make movies and distribute movies for micro budgets. Not small budgets, but micro budgets. What you should do is go online, Google Ted Hope, and start reading his website, reading everything he has. I don't know if he has a book or not. And through that, go out and look at other people like Ted. But Ted talks about all the things that we've talked about here tonight on, on the very, very smallest level. So yeah, I think he's Ted Hope. I don't know if you know this, probably if you're here from Kansas City, Ted did, they did Ang Lee's Ride of the Devil here, so a lot of people, oh, yeah, that's I, I right, worked, right, right. I worked yeah. with Ted and James, yeah. that was uh, one of the last. But there are a handful of people like Ted that are discussing these very issues from a first time filmmaker's point of view, and so you definitely go read that stuff. Yeah. I have a quick question. <clears throat> okay, so we know that, you know, total runtime and, you know, content obviously, but are there certain things you know? So you were pretty, seemed pretty solid that this doc is not, it's gonna have a hard time finding funding. What, are, are there certain things that are gonna make something not marketable? 
not marketable? Not marketable. Are there certain uh, from, 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 docu from a documentary well, point of view? Well, not necessarily documentary. From any standpoint. But I guess my question is, you know, there are some obvious things. You know, it's got to fit within certain criteria. But assuming... I think you can make films less marketable. Um, we talked about a little bit less. Title, too. Though. You, you Title. Yeah, it's got so, um, you know, when you think about secondary markets, language, smoking... Violence. These are all these are all hot button issues with censorships with censors around the world, mm -hmm. and and so it doesn't. You can wind up maybe. I mean, it's one thing you make you make a movie like The Road, and you're expecting you're expecting what you're expecting, but it's another thing when you make a movie that's more of a drama. Or you, I I just I don't. You know, I shouldn't be so anti smoking. People want to smoke smoke, but I don't understand for the life of me why characters light up in movies. It's such a turn off to censors around the world. You have no idea. It just it, you look at a cigarette pack in Europe. It look they show you they show you cancerous lungs on the cigarette pack, and so they they, they don't like that. And it, it immediately gets you out of daytime time periods. You cannot play during daytime. You're now ten thirty and up. You hurt yourself. So if you're going to make something that's sort of middle of the road, yeah. I mean, one of my most successful films the last couple of years, and we've talked about this a couple of things, is a little Alyssa Milano movie that was shot in Utah called My Girlfriend's Boyfriend, Chris Corman, Paul Bridges. It's done so well, it's so harmless, it's so milk toast. <laughs> wholesome. It's so wholesome, but it's already passed 500,000 in digital. It's rocking. Warner Brothers has it out in digital, and they are they, they want to renew it for another four years. And it, it's funny because I had like Showtime come along and offer me how much I these numbers twenty five thousand dollars, which would take away all the digital because they don't want it. Same thing, the subscription video on demand services, Netflix. That and I looked at it and I'm like, you got to be kidding me! I'm doing that a month with your with the movie. I mean, I, I really think that that some of these linear pain networks. Are going to have are going to have continuous problems over the next few years. That's why they all work so hard to develop series because the movies don't don't drive audiences for them anymore because the movies are so available in so many other places. But you can't see Boardwalk Empire someplace else. You can't you can't see Weed someplace else. You have to subscribe to these services to see these things, and that's that's what drives them. And they're able to get away with more things. But again, if you make something. That's that 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 is. If you're going to make something that's really shocking, you better be you better be Eli Roth. You better be really good at it. Um, elsewise, there's a zillion things out there that, like even my movie I showed last night. You know how many how many found footage movies there are that that are out there right now looking for distribution or 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 being produced or in post or whatever. It's crazy. Even. 3D movies a year. I can one from one year no 3D movies to the next year there were over 60 3D movies being offered. Yeah, all well, good. Most of them stink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's hard to, it's, uh, but it's what buyers sort of like Woof, that direction. Tell them about what Germany switched their their uh, censorship laws like violence. Oh, violence. Yeah, Germany yeah, is the Germany's worst. Germany's a big territory. You don't want to. Yeah, you can't. Sell you, that. People, first of all, Germany at. When, when school shootings happened in Germany, as opposed to here in the United States, where everyone's like, oh, that's too bad, they changed their media laws. They changed their censorship laws. They made it much tougher to show violence on television during certain hours because they felt they're so sensitive to propaganda and media, media influence in the, in the culture that they felt that this was doing it. So a movie like The Last Hostel had 20 minutes removed from it in Germany, and Constantine, the distributor, is under federal indictment for showing it. And it also in Germany it gets what's known as an 18 rating, which is like NC-17 here, and it's just that's it. It's toast. Won't get into any video stores. Won't get into anywhere. It just it's very hard to distribute. So you have, but you can just go a little bit. You know, what Germans do is this is what I find funny is because EU is just it's like one big one big marketplace. They go to France or they go to Benelux and they buy the movies without without any any censorship, without anything cut out. And since everyone speaks English, they just watch it in English and it's over with. <laughs> and no one buys it. And Constantine, the German distributor, winds up not only under indictment but screwed because they can't sell the DVDs because it's, it's so much has been cut out of it. So you have to be you have to be really aware of that. And U.S. networks are really very very tough now on on stuff that they want on the air. And there's certain violence and, and smoking and and anything to do with anything. I hate to say it, women issues. Uh, but you know, this our our own country has made it such a big issue that they don't want to even go there. Um, so women, 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 abortion, contraception, um, 
anything to do with that, they don't, they, they're afraid to go there, unless it's something that's gonna make be a message. Violence toward animals. Tyrannosaur is a good example. Yes. Such a fantastic film, and it's been having such a hard time because of that one scene. I don't know if anyone's familiar. I am. Which film? Yeah, yeah where he, with the dog? Yeah. Yeah. When he eats a dog? Eat dogs. It's a brilliant work of art, that film, but, uh, like, really, like, he kills the dog. Yeah, he kills the dog in a really brutal way. It's, it's not gratuitous. It's, it's right. part of the journey. It's uh, purposeful. But it's, 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 it's a festival film. actually no. show it versus Jurassic Park where you just see a dog house hanging out of the... Yeah, out of the yeah. No, it's pretty explicit. Yeah. But it's interesting because listening to this, we have two types of films that I talk about in my work. It's a festival film or it's a circuit film. So it's something that'll work potentially at our festival, at TIFF or at um, several of the dozens of festivals we work with across the country that we help to program, or it's a circuit film that we can help book across the country with the groups we work with, and that tends to be a microcosm of what happens in the larger industry, and the rest of the screens that we have nothing to do with. It tends to mirror, one tends to mirror the other, those two sensibilities. So I guess it depends um, what kind of market appeal you're looking for when you're dealing with such sensitive yeah. issues. But you know, there are, th what, what TIFF does happens in the United States too, Sundance, Sundance has a, a right, thing right. Yeah, that they're, they're going around the United States, and Tribeca now has an enterprise division, and they're also, they're, they're acquiring films and they're, they're taking them around the United States. So there is, it's, it's created this sort of secondary marketplace for these, these films, and they, it, it does get them distribution. That's another really important thing to look for, too, when you're choosing your festivals. And I mean, the same way that you can choose the wrong distributor, or not that you always have a thousand options, but you can choose to apply to the wrong festivals and you can take away your chances to get into some by accepting a really tiny festival that's in the same region as a yeah. really major one you had a shot at. So be strategic, look at the ones that do have um, a traveling aspect. A lot of them do actually, so does London, BFI London Film Festival, yeah. Sundance does now too. They're having Sundance London for the first time this year in, in London, England, and they also travel around the States and they have um, a screening in LA. I can't remember the program's name, but our, <coughs> my so fellow juror was just telling me about it. Um, so look, try to look for that. Try to look for where there's um, accessibility for you to get on screens related to that greater cultural organization. I mean, we also have a program called Real Talk where we only show things on the Sunday Real Talk uh, series that have don't have Canadian distribution that our audiences wouldn't otherwise see. So. I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you.